All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Dai Shihan Miller, and we are here with our Wednesday, uh, Whiteboard Wednesday, right? Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. And uh, for those of you who tune in live, uh, I apologize. We're running real, a little bit late uh, this week. We've got a Kid Ninja uh, martial arts camp that we do, and that kind of stuff. I uh, was kind of falling behind and then, or running behind, and then uh, had a couple of technical glitches. So anyway, we're here and ready to go. Uh, the topic for today, what I want to talk about is um, – the Kiona Po, right? That everybody in the Bujinkan, uh, Bujinkan Ninjutsu, uh, Bujinkan Budo Tajutsu, right? Oh, you guys know this stuff, right? So we get this this uh, the set, right, of supposedly eight fundamental techniques, right? Um, but what I want to take a look at is uh, some things that a lot of people are running around and doing, but what we really want to do is take a look at 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 what's really going on, what the lessons are conveying, right? So if you want, uh, not just clarity, but right, if you want to make sure that you're doing things uh, the right way, you're able to progress past uh, just getting stuck in, in beginner mode, right? For years, Hatsumi Sitze has always said, right? Uh, there's, there's this beginner mind. And I don't mean like always keeping your mind fresh and open like a beginner so that you can explore. I'm talking about people getting stuck, right? regardless of what their rank is, regardless of what this thing is, right? Uh, people can get stuck in, in certain levels of training, right? And one of those things is getting so attached to set kata that they never get the lessons that the kata are presenting, okay? So one of these analogies that I give my students is, you know, let's say we go to a, uh, I don't know, a furniture uh, store and we need to buy some new furniture uh, for the living room or the parlor or whatever you have to call it in your part of the world, right? Where we greet, uh, you know, visitors and they kind of sit around and, and do their thing, right? So you go to this place, right? And you buy this furniture, okay? And it's going to be delivered, right? So they, they drive this truck to your house and it uh, has all this, uh, you know, furniture in the back and whatnot, right? So uh, what what happens then, right? It, they show up with the with the truck, right? Do they drive the truck through the front door and park it in your living room because you bought living room furniture, right? Uh, you know, do, do they do they park it in the yard? And so then what you're going to do is you're going to uh, uh, go out and you know they they have to leave the truck, right? Because you're going to climb into the back of the truck and you're going to sit in the furniture there because well you know it's it's in the truck. See. And I, I, this may sound a little bit confusing, but what I'm talking about here is the kata, right? What most people miss is that the kata is a delivery vehicle, right, that's loaded with lessons, okay? So the kata, just like the delivery truck, the kata can get you to a certain point, but there's other stuff that we have to know or understand or whatever to get the furniture, the lessons, right, the principles, concepts, things like that out of the truck and into a position, into a place that serves us, right? That's functional, okay? And I know how a lot of people would, would you know, want to sit around and argue this stuff, and, and that's okay. You know what? I, I just don't have those kind of uh, discussions with folks, it's just like I don't discuss uh, the internal workings of a, or the workings of an internal combustion engine uh, and say I need to do some work on my car, and I got a six-year-old standing next to me going, ah, what if, yeah, but, and, and you know, uh, that thing, does it work this way? I don't have that conversation, right? Because they're not old enough to understand a lot of those things. So that's not another conversation, right? I'm not calling other people six-year-olds, but, you know, play it for what you need, okay? So anyway, I have these things laid out, right, that most people know today. But what I need to tell you is that way back in the day, right, uh, 1980 through the early to mid-80s, before these kata lists surfaced, right, and then everybody started running around like stamp collectors or coin collectors um, trying to make sure that they were collecting all these things, right? Um, before that, the Kiona Bo was in its an original form, right? We didn't, we weren't told, right, that there were these eight models and things like that, right? We were given these models that had to do with an Ichimonji type strategy, a Jumonji type strategy. They might not even be called these things. In all my earlier notes, what I have is a um, long range defensive uh, defense or action against uh, a straight punch, a kick, a hook punch, an uppercut, whatever, right? I have an intercepting preemptive uh, defense against, right? Those kind of things that they may or may not have included Ichimonji. They might have had Doko or Sagan or something like that instead, right? Same thing with Jumonji. It might have been Kosei. It might have been whatever, right? But everything was based off those things. 
So um, for those of you who have my uh, Sanshin Kyonopo uh, home study course, uh, I don't know if it's a mastery course or advanced home study course or whatever, right? Uh, originally came out in DVD a whole bunch of years ago, right? I did this, this weekend intensive crash course kind of thing. And we went through these things. And if you have it, you know that we spent a lot of time on Ichimonji because this thing is loaded with all these principles and concepts. And then, you know, we went through and then at the very end, we really had to rush through to get some of these things done because my weekend was running out. Right. But if you had that course, right, what I explain and what I demonstrate throughout that course is the different models we have because we didn't call it Ichimonji no Kata. Right. We didn't call it Jimonji no Kata. Right. There are these different models that I have. OK. Um, not all the models have Muso Dori. I'm sorry. It's not Muso Dori. This is supposed to be what most people are used to today. Da, da, da. See, my brain's in three different places. Musha Dori. OK. So uh, we had, you know, with these different things, we had several different variations of things. Right. But what everybody has now is this is this thing. Right. And in reality, and I don't know how many people know this, it doesn't really matter to me whether you know it or not, it's slightly important as to make sure that you're not tripping over yourself. And again, this is only if you want to make sure that you're doing things in the way that it was passed down so that you can extrapolate the lessons, right? So um, the Kihon Hapo concept, right, comes from the Gyoko school, right? So here's, here's the door buster, right? Most people think the Kyoto Po is eight techniques, except in the Gyoko to you where the damn principle comes from. It's not eight techniques, right? It's uh, minimum 16. And that's just the forms that you have, okay? Because there's a left and right side for every one, right? And only that part is the same, okay? Because it's based on the Sanden Kamai of the Gyoko school, right? The rest of these things... Uh, and there's like four or five different models just for Omote Gyaku, right? All this stuff. Okay. Ganseki's not on the list, right? Something called uh, Jigoku Otoshi is on the list. Jigoku Otoshi means throwing them into hell, okay? To do that technique correctly, it's pretty important that you understand where hell is, okay? And it's not just throwing them on the ground, right? There are all these little reference points and whatnot, okay? So, and I know I've covered some of these things in the past. We've done a whole thing on the on the gyakute, right? And what we're really doing with balance breaking and all that kind of stuff, right? Taking a look at the sun then come I. Well, so here we are on the in the Kyonopo again, right? So I wanted to come at this from a different perspective. And again, this is going to be something we're, we're diving into uh, during the, the this Friday's class, right? So again, there's that that link down there if you want to go check out uh, what my plans are for this Friday's virtual class. But anyway, so um, one way to look at this, right, this Kyohon Hapo principle, right, is in being able to take any one of your kata, right, and being able to do them in eight directions. Okay, because Kihon, right? Kihon, again, you have to put up my crappy writing, right? Kihon Hapo. Okay, most people translate it, that as what? Okay. Eight techniques, eight basic techniques, eight fundamentals, or whatever, right? But there's this implication that there's eight techniques. That doesn't say eight techniques. Okay? Kihon, fundamental, right? Fundamental as in like foundation. Like you need these. These are the core pieces. What's being conveyed right here, right, are the most important things that's going to show up everywhere else. Okay? So without it, you can't do anything else. Okay? Hatsumi Sensei, Takamatsu Sensei, Hatsumi Sensei's teacher, said if you have the Kiyono Po, you don't need anything else. Okay? Focus on that. But that doesn't mean that we're focusing on eight damn techniques. Okay? Kiyono Po. Hop Po. Right? Well, it must be like eight techniques or, you know, eight ways because it's a contraction, right? Hop Po is a contraction of Hachi Ho. Right? Linguistically, when the Japanese bring that together, just like uh, uh, Roku Ho right? The six ways, right? Whatever, right? Six directions, six ways, that kind of thing. It becomes ropo, right? Okay. So it's a contraction, but it's not eight things. It's not eight items. That would be kihon hapan. Okay. So, and I don't give a shit what anybody else is saying. I, I absolutely do not. Right. So, um, 
here's one way to look at eight ways, right? Is can you do any one of your kata in eight directions? Well, since if he's punching me this way, why would I end up going it? It's not about punching, punching you in that direction, right? Can you by very, at the very beginning, can you just go into Ichimonji in eight directions? Okay. So what that implies is the attack is coming from given directions, right? And I need to be able to shift into my kumai to be able to, now, now that I had to do that, can I finish the kata, right? In that direction, left and right, right? So moving this way, moving this way, right? Eight ways. Can you do it eight ways? The other way, and this is the way that I was initially in, uh, initiated to this, right? Kyoto Po had nothing to do with a number of things. Like I said, way back in the day, we didn't know that there was, there was no eight, right? The eight had to do with this idea of making variation, okay? Henka, right? So we have a kata. Well, ichimonji, right? I'll make it this way, right? Ichimonji, right? So we're going to make eight variations of that kata. And then every single variation, we're going to make eight variations off of those. And then every single one of those variations, we're going to make eight variations off of those. Until eventually what happens is every single one of these just becomes a potential, right? Because we need to understand what's going on here as well. Okay. What the hell's going on here? Okay. People translate form, all that kind of stuff, right? You know, everybody knows what a kata is, right? Do we? Okay. There's too, way too many assumptions flying around that's jamming people up and jacking their training, right? And preventing them from, from moving past what we call white belt mind. I don't give a shit what color this is. I, I don't, okay? If we're stuck in looking at things like a baby, right? If I'm a second, third, sixth, whatever degree black belt, and I'm still doing these kata, like a beginner is introduced to them, no growth has taken place. Zero. Just because I can do it faster, better, smoother, whatever, in a dojo, that doesn't mean that I learned anything from it. It means that I learned the model, but all that means is I learned how to drive the truck. What about the lessons? What about the, the furniture that the truck is delivering to my house, right? Do I understand that the vehicle can get me so far, but after that, there's different skill sets and different things that I need to do to be able to get the furniture off the truck, through the front door, into the room it's supposed to go to, set up so it's functional for what it's what it's there for, all that stuff, right? All of these things are different phases in a whole process, right? If you understand the shuhari principle, then nobody should be stuck here just doing the kata for the kata's sake because that means you're stuck in the first level of training, shu, right? To copy, to preserve, right? To obey, right? Do it this way no matter what. That means we're, we haven't gone through the ha, breaking process, right? And we certainly haven't gone through the ri, transcendence process, right? Most people, they learn this just because they have to, right? But what they really want to do as quickly and easily as possible is to just simulate what Hatsumi Sensei is doing, either ignoring, being ignorant of, or, or dancing around the fact that they need to go through the same process that he went through from here to where he is. But what they want to do is just move around like him. Okay. Well, how the hell is he able to do all that? Right. What does he know that I don't know that if I don't know those things, I better have a better structure to keep somebody coming in on me. Right. Anyway. Right. So here's this no kata, right? No is just a connector word at this moment, at, at, the, at the moment. You can say ichimonji kata, right? Pretty much comes out the same way. It's less formal, but ichimonji no kata, right? Kata in this case means example, right? So what's it being implied, just like ichimonji itself, right? The word ichimonji, ichi one, monji, character, right? Figure one, character one, or whatever, right? The way the Chinese, Japanese write a number one. Okay, we covered this before, right? What is this? Okay, it's just like hieroglyphics. What is it? It's a picture of the ground. Okay, it's a picture of the ground. So the kanji name is pointing, or the, the 
kata, the, the kamai name, is pointing to the figure one, to the kanji. What the hell does that mean? But it's it's a picture of the ground. So, yeah, it can be used to mean, like, to count, number one, right? But it also means foundation. It implies basics. It implies uh, core. It, impl- it implies uh, fundamentals, right? What's being, being pointed to is that if this is screwed, anything that's built on top of it is not going to withstand the test of time, okay? This, no matter how well built this, this house is, if it's on shaky ground, it's screwed, right? It's screwed, okay? So what I was taught long before everything got I don't know, modified for the masses, right? What I was taught is that this is an example of how to use this come on or this come on or, you know, okay. We were also taught, you know, to look at gyoko to you, koto to you, kukishinden, doko, uh, koto, however you want to describe uh, doko, right? A lot of people, a lot of people don't even train with doko anymore. And that was like this huge fundamental thing way back in the day. Even Seno Sensei, uh, one time in Japan, was, was teaching off this doko. And he even said, you know, we used to do this all the time. And now, like, nobody nobody does it, right? Uh, and he wasn't sure why, right? But anyway, right? So uh, it's an example, right? This kata that everybody's given as an initiation, and that's what kata should be seen as, an initiation to a set of ideas, okay? So here's an example Right, because when I went through, what we learned was ichimon no kamai, and then we learned ichimon no kata, and then we learned variations of ichimon no kata, so we could get our head wrapped around the principles and concepts at play. Okay, but the base model is an example of how this would be used. Okay, same thing with jimon no kata, same thing with ichio, same thing. Okay, so it's one way to look at it, right? But but what I wanted to take a look at is is this idea that these are vehicle, right? And they're carrying, they're, they're, they're kind of presenting core principles that we have to have, okay? The Friday class, we're going to be looking at six core principles and concepts that if you have those, oh, shit just gets super easy, right? I don't mean that dealing with this guy and his violence and rage and all that is an easy task, but it makes things really, really easy, right? Because if we understand Sanchin, and the point of Sanchin is penetration. What it's teaching is how the hell do I get in on him without him being able to defend, resist, uh, duck, cover, counter, whatever, right? If I understand Kyonopo, right? What I was taught, Kyonopo is all about is energy conservation. It's a rule of survival, okay? How do I do these things? How do I get these things in on him, right? With the least amount of wear and tear on myself, right? Effectively, efficiently, quickly, whatever, right? And he can't stop it, right? He can't stop me from doing it, right? But if all I'm ever doing is like doing my kata and again, you know, in the shoe stage of training, right? I do my thing. My partner does his. His job is to help me learn this. He's working on his own stuff, but his job is to help me with this. There's no resistance or anything like that. As we start moving up in these different levels of transcendence or tra- uh, transmission, right? That all changes, Okay. You hit a certain level where if your uke can avoid, cover, counter, whatever, they're supposed to do that. Okay, So this always keeps going back to, right? Everybody that wants to look at this, this basics, the basic stuff, I, that's, that's such a trap, right? Such a, such a tricky word, right? The basics, like looking at the jodiaku no kata, right? As the beginner stuff. Looking at the shoden no maki as the beginner stuff. It's not beginner right? It's the most important stuff. What I was taught is if you learn the first level scroll stuff and you understand, because all the principles and concepts for the lineage are in those kata. If you learn those and you lost all the scrolls, you could recreate Chuden no Maki, Okuden. You, you, could, you, could, you could recreate them, right? That's why there's less and less kata as you go up the levels because all the important shit, right? It's, not be, it's beginner because it's the most important stuff. Get good at this, right? So, what we're looking, what, what, so what are we looking at? 
Okay. What are we looking at? Right. Again, I'm going to be drawing all over the place here and I'll keep erasing. You guys have the recording so you can kind of play around with this. Right. So we're going to zip through this. Right. Ichimo Jokata. Right. And again, we could be pulling all kinds of things out of here. Right. Depending on whether you're looking at timing, distancing, whatever. But let's look at the distance. Right. Ichimo Jokata. Right. He throws his punch. I shift back. I do my thing. Now we've got this long range kind of thing. I'm stretching him out. That's all great. But don't ever forget that the distance you create is the distance you need to make up to get back in on him. Okay? And Ichimo no Kata is about striking or countering. Right? I know. Sloppy writing, right? Striking or counting, countering while stepping. Right? I'm way back here. I need to get all the way in here. So what's being taught? Everything between here and here is the important stuff because I have to control him and take away his ability to counter, evade, escape, block, duck, cover, whatever. I have to take it away. But what do people focus on? Avoiding the strike and then doing their cool move except all the cool moves are in the gap between evasion and shoot to the neck. If I get that, then all my henka, all my variations should do the exact same thing, regardless of what those variations look like. It's not the form, right? The form is what the magic looks like temporarily, momentarily. Right? We're given kata so that we can start exploring things. We have a form that we can duplicate over and over again so we can extrapolate these lessons. But it's not, it's not about the kata. It's not not about the kata because you have to learn it. Right, You have to learn it so that you can pull the lessons out. Right, But it's about striking or countering while stepping. I need to screw this guy up through balance breaking, timing, distraction, whatever it is so that I can go from way back here all the way back in there without having to rely on the crudeness of speed and strength and adolescent trickery, that kind of stuff, right? That's, that's the idea, right? Jumonji no kata, right? Jumonji no kata, you start in Jumonji, but your first move is to go to Ichimonji, okay? And then what, right? Boom, boom, okay? What's it doing? right? It's stalling the other strike. It's keeping him from coming in at me, right? But at the very base, it's striking, countering, whatever, right? Without stepping. You don't have time for Tajitu. You don't have time for that, that big movement, that full on body kind of thing. You have, you got to counter and stop him, right? You don't have the distance. You don't have the time. He's fast, whatever. You need to boom. You need to, to jam him up to stall the next thing from getting at you. Okay? Hicho no kata. What's up with the hicho no kata? Right? Well, hicho no kata, right? In the Gyoko school, again, people want to collect the stuff on the densho, right? All the all the techniques, right? I got this one, I got that one, I get fantastic. Do you have the makimono? Right? Do you have the scrolls that actually have the philosophy and the and the, the mindset, right? The warrior mindset that drives the step-by-step -step models on the Densho. The Densho is just a list of examples, right? But they are what they are because of the stuff on the Makimono. The stuff was split. Steel one, you don't have anything else, right? Okay. So, but in the Makimono, one of the core principles in the Gyoko to you is never get caught on one foot. And yet, here we have a freaking Kamai where you're on one foot. Okay? We've talked about this stuff before, right? But what are we doing? What are we doing in here? Okay, We're actually combining these two things. Okay, He's attacking. He can come in with something else again because the way he came in, I don't care if it was a little leg sweep or a shot to the ribs or whatever, right? And the way I ended up jamming it up was my foot came up off the ground. The human body can't steer until the other until that foot comes back down to the ground again. You can try to bob and weave and do all kinds of fancy gymnastics, but you're not going anywhere from there, right? You're going to be trying to do like 
Taekwondo kind of things in place. But the reality is that if everything else on your body moves, that thing, that base leg is still there. And if I'm dealing with somebody with a long reach or long reach, sword, spear, remember, we have to remember historically why this stuff was created. Okay, stop thinking about translating it from the 21st century context and figure out why it was made based on 13th, 15th, whatever century context. And then once you understand that, then you can look back in the 21st century and go, holy shit, that's for that. In today's world, I would use it for that. Okay, kind of like Hanbo being on a what if scroll, right? Because nobody in their freaking, in their, in their right mind would be going into a battlefield in ancient Japan against long weapons with a, with a little stick. Okay. It was for when your staff or spear or whatever got cut. Okay. So we have to understand, but in today's world, shit, nobody has a walking stick that's that long. Right. So each and kata, what are we doing? Right. We're jamming them up. We're stalling their next thing. We're locking them in place so we can get back into position. Right. So we're creating a stall moment. Okay. Creating, I'm going to call, I'm, I'm going to use my own terminology here. Right. I'm going to, we're creating hang time. Right. He throws a punch. Right. Shifts out of that counters my, my thing. Right. I go to throw the next thing and I get kicked in the ribs that kind of locks me down. Right. Uh, uh, master teachers and, and Hatsumi Sensei has never used it, but people have used this over, over my training career to describe what Hatsumi Sensei was doing. And several people used to say it was like he was putting you in a vice and locking you down. You couldn't move. So he could do that next thing. Uh, other people said it was like he backed you up against the, the you know, the, the, the last step or the edge of the step on a staircase or on a cliff. Right. And you hit that moment where you start to go and your whole body locks up and you just because uh, if you move, you're going to fall. Right. So you're just being put in this position. Right. And then. Yeah, that's follow up, not a different type of FU. Right. So. What are we doing? Right? They're models for. Okay? From long range, you don't just get to go, da, 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 right? Without somebody punching you in the face, or stabbing you, or whatever it is, right? This one, there's a certain timing that's needed, right? It's almost like a half beat kind of thing, right? I need to boom, boom. I need to be able to get them. Not one, two. You're going to get punched in that second one, right? Okay, hecho, right? I'm jamming it. Boom, I need to stall that next thing, right? Same thing we're doing here. There's that stall, okay? So striking with stepping, striking without stepping, this is a bailout kind of thing, right? Okay? I got to do something now. I got to stall this guy, right? So I can do the next thing. That could be I stall or I catch him, right? One of your, one of your hecho variations could be I catch it I get, and I move back out and I recreate distance so he has to start again, okay? Because if my balance is slightly off, right? Or I'm on unstable ground, I'm on loose stone, rock, whatever, right? And, and I don't feel like in this moment after I kick that I can just, I can go, right? Remember, this has to be at full speed. If I don't feel like I, ha I can go, I better be able to like shift back into another kamai or bail or roll from that position or from Hicho leap, right? Leap away on one foot to that same foot or leap from that foot, turn, land on the other foot, right? Same idea. We talked about some of these some of these things, right, um, along the way when I was looking at Gyakute and all that, but I'll take a look at something different, okay? So we're going to springboard off of it. Let me change color here. Sorry about that. We'll change color so we can move through these, get around that one, right? So Omote Gyaku, Uda Gyaku, we had, a, we had a, a lesson before about that, right? Omote Gyaku is this obvious way of breaking the balance off the heels, right? Because that's easy. That's the obvious way, right? Uda Gyaku wasn't just taking them off their toes because you take somebody forward, they bend over, everything gets neutralized. So the balance line is where, right? It's from the edge of the feet all the way out to the length of the torso. You got to bring that back, right? So that's all great. Ura gyaku, omote gyaku, right? Here's your base, right? So it's this idea. How do I take, how do I throw this guy or take him off balance backwards, but long range? Okay. 
I think we did a lesson on this with uh, the uh, three and one, one and three principle way, way back, right? Linking common techniques. So omote gyaku, right? We'll take the person off their heels, okay? Oni kudaki, we'll take the person off their heels, okay? Musha dori, we'll take the person off their heels. Um, Osotonage, the rear hip throw, we'll take the person off their heels. All that stuff, right? But it's that principle used at long range, okay? Way out here, okay? Taking them off their feet, right? Ura gyaku is working that principle we talked about during that video, right? When I say long range, I mean I'm as far away from this guy's body as I can, you know, I can I can handle, right? Anything farther than that, I'm going to end up letting go, okay? So long range. How do I do these things, right? So there's the basic model. But then it's throwing some extra variations in here, okay? So Oni Kodaki, it's the same thing, but it's mid-range. Mid-range, right? long range, backwards. Long range, forward. Or, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, backwards. Of course, everybody can take somebody down backwards with an Uda Gyaku, right? Okay. Uh, Oni Kodaki, right? Mid range. Which way? Backwards. Ganseki Nage. Or uh, in the Gyoko Ryu, uh, Jigoko Otoshi, right? Uh, Muso Dori, all those kind of things, right? You're still looking at mid range. Mid range. Forward. Right? Fantastic. You have all those. Right? Got to get the Musha Dori. Okay. Yes, we could look at taking somebody just off their feet, right? But in the Gyoko Ryu Muso Dori, you are locking them close range and then. See if I can back up far enough for this, right? You catch, you have them, and from right here, kakushigiri, right? So through a hicho, kicking through a hicho, snap that knee out from under them, under them. So instead of dragging them down or breaking their balance and taking them off, right? What you're doing is putting them in that vice we talked about, right? So just like with the hicho, right? Locking them down. And breaking him. Okay? So I'm locking him down. And instead of trying to wrestle the shoulder, because the reality in a lot of these situations right here is if the guy's stronger or you, you miss your timing or you don't quite get out here where, where it's supposed to be, right? He can resist. So what if you can't lift the elbow to the shoulder? Well, that's okay. You snap his knee out from under him. You're going to hold this in place and he's going to drop. So you don't have to take the elbow to the shoulder. You're going to drop the shoulder to the elbow. And it'll still blow it out. Okay? So if we look at these things from a different perspective, if we look at them from the principle or concept that's going on, we answer the question, what am I doing? Why am I doing this thing? Right? Then we can look at the the how right the kata the how right from a whole different perspective okay it's kind of like when i do these lessons right there are these really big you know it's like the 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 dirigible or whatever over the over the sports stadium or the drone over the sports stadium right it's really high high kind of thing right so what i'm doing is i'm covering the what and the why okay mistakes people are making perspectives that need to happen stuff like that right because people want what what do you want right you want clarity. You want to make sure you're doing it right, right? You don't want to be the guy who spends all this time, effort, money, whatever, right? Developing this sense of confidence and having your ass handed to you because you learned it wrong or somebody taught it to you wrong or you didn't you didn't get it right, right? Worse than that, there's a lot of us that won't don't want to be the guy whose family gets busted up or has to dress in black because I'm in a freaking, you know, box or whatever, right? Um Worse than that is just being alive, right? Your family gets but or worse, right? And you don't die and you have to live for the rest of your life knowing that whatever the hell I learned was fucked up, okay? 
So, and if that's not you, if you're just here to learn some kind of martial art because you want to add another set of moves to other moves that you want to learn, just ignore everything I'm talking about. Because this is about real Buddha. This is about if you screw this up, your family better look good in black. Or if you screw this up, you're going to live with shame, guilt, and all that kind of shit. Or the sad look in somebody's eyes that you could have protected, but it didn't work out. Right? And why didn't it work out? Well, you know, because I assumed, and then, you know what assuming is, right? At making an ass out of you and me. Okay. So, but what, what the hell is going on? So, yes, we need to learn the model. But what is the model teaching us? It's an example of something. It's an example, right? These forms are what the, in, in Mikio, we have this idea of the form, the formless, right? And then there's this other realm beyond that, right? The, the beyond formless or sometimes it's just translated as formless, formless, right? Which really screws with people's heads, right? But if we look at this, if you didn't pay attention in science class in middle school or junior high school or whatever, I apologize. Uh, but I'm going to say it this way anyway, right? We all know about atoms and molecules and all this kind of stuff. We don't need to get into, into you know, ions and we, no, just, just atoms and molecules, right? This is the soup that everything is made out of, right? My body is made up of the same things, right, in different in different uh, alignments or whatever as a chair that I'm looking at across the, the way or this striking target, the material it's made out of. Right. Okay. So here's this stuff, right? We can, we can't even see it, right? We can, we can theorize it. If somebody let us borrow an electron microscope, we could see it. Right. But here's the, the, the primordial essence of, of everything, all these little building blocks and stuff, right? It's the formless. It's they're just little pieces, right? Like a, like a set of Legos, right? get all these pieces, one piece, two piece, four piece, strips, flat parts, whatever, right? And we can just build shit out of it, okay? So that's great. But how do you make sense out of something like that? How do you even get your head wrapped around that, right? Well, they give you forms, right? You buy a Lego set that is in the shape of what? Uh, the, the, the Death Star, or whatever, right? You, you buy this model kit that, that has all the pieces to make this thing, right? So you get it, you put it all together and you make this thing, right? So you can let it there, right? You put it on a shelf and, oh, look what I made. Yay, go buy another one, right? Or you can get that, get the gist of how these pieces go together, right? And recognize, oh, I see how they did that. That's really cool. Oh, and this came with some couple of extra little pieces, right? That's going to help me out, right? And then do what they do with Tibetan mandala, right? They make it out of sand. It's all there. It hangs out for a day or three, and then they psh, destroy it, right? Put all the sand, you know, in the river, back in where it came from or whatever. Same thing. You can take that model apart, right? Put all your pieces in different places. So later on, you can build other things. You can build whatever, right? But all these model kits, all these Lego kits that you get, I don't give a shit if it's the Harry Potter series or the Star Wars series or the Lego classic series, whatever, right? You get these boxes and they're all designed. Here's, here's this thing that you're making, right? They're all the same damn pieces. You go into a Lego store, there's a whole wall, right? With all these little bins and every bin has a gazillion of one piece. And then this bin has a different piece, and right? So if you're missing pieces or whatever, you can go buy these things, whatever, right? But ultimately, they're all the same pieces. There's this process, right? What are the pieces? What are the pieces supposed to be doing, right? Are they framing a window or whatever, right? Okay. What are the pieces doing, right? So that you can get the gist of this. Because on the street, in a bad situation, you're going to have to make this shit up on the fly. Based on what he's doing, based on the environment, based on the situation, based on your physical state in the moment, your emotional state in the moment, right? Where your head is, right? Because if you're just on honeydew shopping list, next thing you know, you take one or two shots in the face already. You haven't dropped. And from that mental state, you need to make sense of what's going on. What's going to happen, right? We spend all this time, effort, and money to go through all this stuff and learn it. And when it comes right down to it, we're going to end up defending ourselves just like everybody else. What the hell is that? Okay. So again, the choice is always yours, right? The choice is always the students, teachers, whatever, right? Are you going to look at these things as just techniques, right? Just more stamps or coins to go in the collection, 
right? I got mine. See, I got I filled my filled my koto to you show them no maki uh, stamp book, right? I got all those kata, right? Um, or are we going to see them as principles, right? And the this the the form, the example is an expedient. It's there long enough for you to get what you need from it, and pl- trust me, there's plenty, there's plenty, right? Just like there was the can you do the kata, right? Or the kamai in eight directions, right? How many different perspectives? How many different situations, real world situations, environments, attacker types, whatever, right? Can this be applied against? And how might it have to be adjusted to do the exact same thing against somebody broader than you, taller than you, armed with a knife, whatever, right? Still eight ways. It's still hapo. It's still hachiho. Right? But it's not just people look at this stuff, they get through it and they go, that's basic stuff, man. I got that. Let's go. Really? Awesome. Okay. Next time you're doing shiaku, tangeki, seon, uh, nichigeki, whatever, right? Okay. I want you to pause for a moment and then look inside of it and tell me which sanshin are operating, which principal concepts from the kiona po are operating, all that kind of stuff, right? Because you should be able to look into any kata and very, very quickly go, ah, this is how it locks him down. This is how it controls that. This is how it takes him off his feet. This is how it controls his mind. Okay. Otherwise, it's just another step-by-step monkey move, right? So anyway, that's all I got. Again, for those of you who like to check in live and all that, I apologize for things running a little bit late today. If you're watching a recording on YouTube later on uh, in my future, right? No harm, no foul. Just ignore everything I just said for that, right? Okay. But that's what I got, okay? So, again, the Kionapo is covering what the Kionapo really is pointing to, right? And remember, just a quick reminder, it's Kionapo, not Kihon Hapan. Kihon, fundamentals, Hapan, eight things. Kihon Hapo, fundamentals, eight ways, infinite ways. Hapo, okay? We start with eight directions. He's coming in cardinal directions, whatever. I'm working my angles and all that. But eventually, it should be any of the degrees, 360 degrees around me. Hapo, infinite. Just like uh, uh, Shiho Kiri, right? Front kick, side kick, back kick, cross side kick, right? Eventually, it's Hapo Kiri. Any angle, right? Minus the two or three degrees where you can't kick through your own leg without crippling yourself, right? And why would you do that anyway, right? But the ability to kick anybody on any angle, right, without having to think about it, without compromising yourself, okay? The goal is always freedom of movement, always and forever, okay? That's it. That's all I got. If you want to make it for Friday's virtual class, there's the link. If you can't make it, but, you know, you want the recording or whatever, it's there. It's $4.99, right? If nothing else, just go to the page and take a look at what I'm covering. And uh, that's it. I'll see you next week. All right. Talk to you soon.